Okay, so in this video we're going to be continuing our topic of integration and we're going to be introducing the idea of a definite integral. Now definite integrals have really important applications, um, in particular uh, in relation to area under a curve or areas between curves, and we'll get to that, to that down the track. What I just want to focus on in this um, lesson is the technique of evaluating a definite integral. So no context around what the result actually represents, um, but a, and it can represent, it, they're, they're tools used in lots of different applications. Um, it doesn't always correspond to an area, but we'll talk about its application to area later on. But for now, I just want to practice and learn and establish the process of evaluating a definite integral. So definite integrals are those that have limits of integration. So we've seen in our CAS that when we um, press, you know, whether it's shift plus or menu four, whatever it is, we get this um, uh, template with um, the two little boxes which are sort of greyed out, meaning it's optional whether you put things in there. But that is where you would put the limits of integration. Okay, so here um, we're seeing, you know, A and B on this integral. We would put, you know, A in this uh, lower limit and B in this upper um, limit. Um, so we're going to have a look at uh, sort of what that means. So. Um, the, we would read this as um, the integral um, of f of x from a to b or the integral from a to b of f of x with respect to x and um, those values as I said are called the limits of integration. Um, generally speaking uh, b would be greater than a. There are reasons why you might actually flip them, them around to have the larger um, limit on the bottom um, but we'll have a talk about that later when we have some sense of the application but usually you'll see the smaller value on the bottom and the bigger value at the top. Um, so when we just write an integral like this, which is what we've been doing so far, the integral of x squared with respect to x is called an indefinite integral. And that's because there are no limits of integration. And when there are lo no limits of integration, we get an indefinite answer. We get an answer that still has an unknown constant, the plus c. Um, however, when we have the integral with limits of integration, it's called a definite integral, as we get a definite result. And actually we get it, we'll get a single numerical value. This um, integral, the uh, integral of x squared between um, 3 and 5 is going to be equal to a numerical value. Um, so there's no ambiguity about that result, there's no plus c, there's no unknown component to the answer that you get. Um, the fundamental theorem of calculus, which we won't go into either this year or next year, provides a technique for evaluating definite integrals and we're just going to learn what that technique is rather than where that actually comes from. So if we have f of x, which is a continuous function, function over the interval from a to b, then um, the integral um, from a to b of f of x with respect to x is found by doing sort of two steps. The first step is to actually work out the antiderivative of f of x. Okay? So that's just what we've already been doing. And then in terms of notation, we write that in square brackets and we translate the two limits um, to the end here. Now the notation in this particular function equation is um, not very nice. I'll show you how to write that by hand. Um, then once we've done that, so we've worked out the antiderivative, we've rewritten in square brackets with our um, limits of integration written at the right hand side. Uh, and sorry, they shouldn't turn around. My apologies. So that should be from A to B still. Um, so it should still be the lower one here and the upper one at the top. Um, and then what we do is we take the upper limit, which in, in this case is b. Oh, these are the wrong way around. My apologies. B minus a. Um, we take the upper limit, which in this case is b, and we substitute that into our antiderivative, so uppercase f of b, and then we subtract, and we take the lower limit and substitute that into our antiderivative, so uppercase f of a. Um, and as I said, that's where f, capital F of x, is the antiderivative of uh, lowercase f of x. We have seen that notation much earlier in the topic. Okay, I think we just need to see it through process, um, so let's do some examples. So the integral of x squared from 0 to 4, um, the first thing we focus on is finding our antiderivative, so we're already familiar with that. And the antiderivative is going to be written in square brackets, so the antiderivative of x squared is x cubed on 3. And then we write our limits of integration at the end of the square bracket. Okay. Now the first thing we do is we substitute the upper limit of integration in, so the number at the top. So that's going to be 4 cubed on 3, and we subtract, and then we substitute the lower limit, which is 0 cubed on 3, and then we can evaluate that. So 4 cubed is 64 on 3, it's minus 0, and so we just have 64 on 3. 
Now, there are some contexts, and some of you, if you've, if you've worked a bit ahead or you've seen this before, there are some contexts where it would be relevant to write that as 64 on 3 square units, but that is only if the question is asking you to evaluate an area. Okay, I'll talk more about that when we get to how it applies to area. The, um, when we evaluate a definite integral, it doesn't have to be representing an area. This definite integral is just equal to 64 thirds. Okay, let's have a look at another example. Um, the other thing I want you to be a bit careful about in year 11 while we're talking about that, that here is when you're integrating where one of the limits is zero, it can be very easy to just sort of omit the step where you substitute in zero. Um, and it's very easy to do that in year 11 when we're only anti-differentiating polynomial functions. Okay, oh, and um, when you substitute zero into a polynomial function, it will always give you zero. Um, however, next year, you'll be anti-differentiating exponential functions and cosine functions, and sine functions, etc. And cos of zero isn't zero. E to the zero isn't zero. Okay, so it's really important that you don't lose the, lose the habit that you actually are, sorry, that what you're actually doing is substituting zero into your, into your function. Now, the other thing I should have mentioned here, and I apologize um, to have omitted it, when we actually, I'm going to add in here, you don't need to edit your work, but when we anti-differentiate, we know that we get plus C. Okay, now I didn't write plus C and I didn't write it quite deliberately because we actually don't need to worry about it. And that's because what would then happen at the next step is we substitute our limit of integration into our function and we subtract the function. And that means that every time that we do this, the C's are going to cancel out. Okay, so we don't need to worry about writing plus c at all when we are calculating a definite integral. So that would be true all the time. If you're anti-differentiating from a to b f of x, you get the antiderivative of f of x plus c from a to b, and then you sub a into that, so that's f of a plus c, and you subtract and sub b into that f of b plus c, and every time you're going to get f of a plus c minus f of b minus c and every time the c's are going to cancel out to just leave you with f at a minus f at b. So we don't need to worry about plus c at all when we're calculating a definite integral. Okay. Um, all right, so let's do another one. So antiderivative of x squared minus 2x plus 1 with respect to x from negative 1 to 3. Okay, first thing is we worry about our antiderivative. Uh, and we don't worry about the plus c. So antiderivative of x squared is x cubed on 3. Antiderivative of 2x is 2x squared on 2, so that is um, x squared, so it's minus x squared, and antiderivative of 1 is x. We're doing that from negative 1 to 3. <laughs> okay, then we substitute in, in our upper limit, which will be 3, so that's going to be 3 cubed on 3 minus 3 squared plus 3, we subtract and we substitute in our lower limit, negative 1 cubed on 3 minus negative 1 squared, uh, minus 1, sorry, plus negative 1, so minus 1. Okay, often you're going to have a lot of terms and a lot of fractions when you're integrating. And the mistakes you make won't be anything to do with the integration, they will be to do with carelessness around the numbers missing the fact that you're subtracting a negative or, or not simplifying a fraction correctly or whatever it might be. So my strong advice here is take your time, write out the steps, don't skip too many steps, don't try and do too much in your head, you'll make mistakes as you do it. Okay. So I've just literally, I haven't worked anything out as I've gone, I've just literally substituted in, now I'll focus on simplifying. So 3 cubed on 3, uh, 3 cubed is 27 divided by 3 is 9, minus 3 squared which is 9 plus 3, and then here we've got negative 1 cubed is negative 1, so that's negative a third. Negative 1 squared, though, is positive 1, so that's minus 1, and then we've still got the minus 1. All right, let's just tidy up each bracket. So 9 minus 9, that cancel out, so that's 3. And then this is going to be, uh, now I might just write that as plus 1 third from the minus minus, okay? And then um, we're also going to have, this would be minus 2, and it's minus minus 2, so it's going to be plus 2. Okay, so 3 plus 2 is um, 5, we've got 5 plus a third, 5 is um, 15 on 3 plus 1 on 3, and so it is 16 on 3. Alright, let's have a look at example 3. 
Alright, so before we can anti-differentiate this expression, we need to do some simplifying. So we haven't yet anti-differentiated, so it's still the antiderivative from 1 to 4. And I'm going to write that as 2x on x minus, now 3 root x is 3x to the half on x. So I've a written the root x as x to the half, and I've split this into two separate fractions with respect to x. Okay, antiderivative from 1 to 4, 2x on x is just 2. So we still have an anti-differentiated, we're just simplifying. 3x to the half on x, so when we're dividing powers with the same base, we subtract the power, so half minus 1 is negative half. So it's going to be minus 3x to the negative half with respect to x. Okay, now we're ready to anti-differentiate. So antiderivative of 2 is 2x, uh, and that's going to be minus 3x adding 1 to 1 half, uh, sorry, 1 to negative half is positive half, and then we are um, dividing by positive half from 1 to 4. Okay, I'm going to tidy that up before I substitute in my limits of integration. So that is 2x. Dividing by a half is the same as multiplying by 2. So it's minus 6x to the half or 6 root x from 1 to 4. Okay, now we can substitute. So we're going to have 2 times 4 minus 6 root 4 take away 2 times 1 minus 6 root 1. Okay, so that is 8 minus, now root 4 is 2. 6 times 2 is 12. Now can I be really clear about root 4 doesn't equal plus or minus 2. Okay, root 4, in the same way that 4 is doesn't equal positive or negative 4, it's positive 4. If there's not a negative sign at the front, then it's positive. Okay, this is positive 2. This is positive root 4. Okay, um, the difference is if the question is x squared equals 4, when you take the square root, you must be cautious of the fact that it could be positive or negative root 4. Okay, but if it's just already written as root 4, in the same way that when I write the number 5, I don't mean positive or negative 5, I mean positive 5. When I write root 4, I mean positive root 4. It's a common error students make. Um, so it was 6 times 2, which is times positive 2, which is 12. The negative is from that. Um, and then we've got minus 2 times 1 is 2, um, 6 root 1, root 1 is 1, so it's 2 minus 6. Alright, so what have we got here? 8 minus 12 is negative 4. Take away 2 minus 6, which is negative 4. So negative 4 minus minus 4 is negative 4 plus 4. And so we have 0. Okay, um, some properties of definite integrals. And we'll be able to interpret these a little bit more um, once we look at the connection to area. Okay. Um, but a couple of key things. So the first um, two at the top are things we're already familiar with, with indefinite integrals, and that doesn't change. If you're integrating a sum or a difference of two functions, you can you can split it up into two separate integrals. You wouldn't write it out like that, but that's what we're doing in our head. We're integrating f of x plus integrating g of x, and then we're doing our substitutions, okay? Similarly, uh, constant times a function, can, the constant can come out the front uh, if we want it to. So those are the same as what we're already familiar with. Um, the other thing, the other properties that we're going to look at is uh, this, for example, if we're integrating from A to A, so if we're integrating from A to A, which is a little bit trivial, you won't really see this happening, we know that we anti-differentiate, we get f of x from A to A, and then we sub the upper and lower, lower limits in, which means we get f of A minus f of A, which gives us zero. So that's going to be zero. Um, if we are integrating from f of x from A to B, we can switch around the limits as long as we stick a negative out the front. And if we have a look at why that happens, so if we're integrating from a to b, f of x, that is the antiderivative of f of x is uppercase f of x, integrating um, from a to b. Um, we sub in f of b, and we sub in f of a. Okay. Now, if we were to do it this way around, if we were to work out this one, we've got the negative integral from b to a, of f of x, so that is equal to the negative antiderivative of f of x from b to a, which is the negative of f of a minus f of b. So because you do it, you end up doing the subtraction the other way around, f of a minus f of b instead of f of b minus f of a, when you switch the terminals, the limits, you're going to be doing that subtraction in reverse, putting a negative out the front counteracts that, because then that is the same as um, plus f of a sorry, minus f of a plus f of b, which is f of b minus f of a. 
which is the same as this. So if you want to reverse the limits, so the integral from 1 to 3 of f of x, for example, would be the same as the negative integral from 3 to 1 of f of x. Because you're going to do the switching the limits is going to mean you reverse the subtraction, and so you're creating a negative. Um, so, yeah, you probably will we'll see how that's a sort of useful thing when we look at areas down the track. Um, but you probably won't see that too often, although there'll be an example here where we'll utilise some of these facts. Um, and the third thing is, is that if we're integrating from A to B, well that's the same as integrating from A to C and then integrating from C to B, as long as C is a number that's between A and B. Okay, So if we think about this here, what we've actually got here, that's the antiderivative of F between A and C, and then plus the antiderivative of F between C and B. So this is going to be f of c minus f of a, and then we have plus, this will be f of b minus f of c, oops, f of c, sorry. And so f of c cancels out, and we're left with positive f of b take away f of a. And so we are left with this integral here. Um, so just some properties, as I said, we'll also revisit those when we look at um, integrals in the context of area. Um, but for now, we should be able to um, solve problems such as this one using these properties. Okay, so if we know that the integral from 1 to 4 of g of x is equal to 8, we want to use that fact to evaluate these other integrals. So it's not about knowing what g of x is, it's about how can I isolate this expression in each of these um, questions so that I can substitute 8 in place of that. Okay, so this first one's fairly simple because the only way that this is different from the integral given here is the 2 at the front here. So we know when we're integrating, we can take the 2 out of the integral. 2 times, it's the same as 2 times the integral of g of x. And then we know that the integral from 1 to 4 of g of x is equal to 8. And so this is equal to 2 times 8, which is 16. Um, in part b, thinking about how is this different from this, the only thing that's different is that the limits of integration have been reversed. And so we think, well, okay, this is the same as the negative of, if I switch the limits of integration, the integral from 1 to 4 of g of x with respect to x. And again, now we've been able to isolate that. That is equal to 8. And so this is the same as negative 8. All right, part C. Now students often make mistakes here because they just magically write that plus 1 outside of there, but that's not a property of integrals. Okay, If we've got addition, we can break it into two integrals, but by integrating each part. So this is the same as the integral from 1 to 4 of g of x plus the integral from 1 to 4 of 1. All right, this is 8. Great. So we're going to replace that with 8. And then we can work out this second integral. The antiderivative of 1 is x. We're doing that between 1 and 4. Substituting 4, um, yeah, um, so substitute 4 gives us 4, and substituting 1 gives us 1. So it's 8 plus 4 minus 1, 8 plus 3, which is 11. Okay, so those are fairly common kinds of questions, forcing you to um, demonstrate that you understand some of those properties of integrals. Um, definite integrals using your CAS, um, we've already had a look at this, so shift plus for anti-differentiating, this time you'll just put um, numbers in these limits, so let's perhaps check one of these questions that we did up here, uh, it's going to take me a while to type in, let's try this one, let's integrate from um, negative 1 up to 3 uh, x squared minus 2x plus 1 with respect to x and we get 16 on 3, which confirms what we found. Okay, so the work for today is a mixture of questions from exercise 21b and 21c, and in addition to that, there is a worksheet with some further definite integrals practice.